to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Sing it again. Glory to God. Glory. Glory to God. One more time. Glory to God. Can we say praise the Lord this morning? Praise the Lord this morning. We give glory to God this morning. It is a beautiful summer morning, and we have gathered to worship the King. And we have a worship objective this morning, and it is to prepare our hearts and minds for engaging secular culture just as Jesus would. We want to prepare our hearts and minds for engaging secular culture just as Jesus would. Our call to worship is found in Matthew 10, 19 and 20. Notice what it says. Do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Praise the Lord. We have a scripture lesson this morning. It's found in John 17, verses 13 through 18. It is the high priestly prayer of Jesus before he left earth. And I want you to know that before Jesus left earth, he prayed not only for his disciples that were with him at the time, he prayed for you and I. Uh, he saw you when he was on earth. He saw me when he was on earth. And he prayed for us knowing that we would be uh, in a culture that is not always receptive to the gospel. And Jesus said this, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. The Lord always adds blessing to the reading of his word for the good of our souls. Such is the word of God. I want to pray blessing on our time together live as well as in live stream. Father God, we thank you so much for the privilege of worshiping you. And we thank you that you have made us change agents and meaning makers in a world that has drifted from faith. We have more nuns than we ever have before. N-O-N-E-S. Those that have no religious affiliation, those that are not moored to any kind of faith expression, those who are decidedly secular and flexible in their spirituality. And yet we still understand the gospel and the core of the gospel message. Our Savior Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but through me. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to help the world to reckon with Jesus, to come into a saving knowledge of who you are, Lord Jesus. Stand in us and speak through us. Lord, help us to listen that we're a people not just with answers, but we're a people with questions. We're a people that know how to write, ask the right questions. And yes, we're a people with the right answer as it is Jesus Christ. We thank you that you died on the cross for our sins, that you rose on the third day for our justification. And so help us to be salt and light in this world and to enter the conversation as to who you are. Have your way in our midst. We will glorify you. We will worship you until you return. Bless us this morning. Sanctify us in the truth that we would not be arrogant, that we would not be self-righteous. For, Lord, we are aware of our utter sinfulness. 
And we thank you that you don't call the qualified, but you qualify the called. We declare ourselves as the called. Now qualify us, purify us, perfect us, and conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. That we would go into the world as ambassadors, building bridges, and at times being bridges that are walked on, that people can cross over into life, the fullness of life the abundant life that is in Christ Jesus. We bless this time in Jesus' name. Let everybody say amen. amen. Let everybody say amen. Let everybody say amen. God is using you in this culture. You may be seated as we continue in worship. How many know that when we're in Christ, the Bible says that if a man be in Christ, that the old has passed away, and behold, all things are become new. So as we worship on this next song, I really want you to think about those things that you want to leave behind you so that you can move forward in Christ. Hallelujah. Oh. What a moment you have brought me to such a freedom I have found in you. You're the healer who makes all things new. Yeah, yeah, yes. I'm not going back. I'm moving ahead. I hear to declare to you, my past is over in you. All things are made new. Surrender my life to Christ. I'm moving, moving forward. Whoa, whoa. With all power in your hand, you have given me a second chance. Hallelujah, hallelujah, yeah, 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 oh, yeah, 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 yes. I'm not going back. I'm moving ahead. I'm here to declare to you my past is over in you. All things are made new. Surrender my life to Christ. I'm moving. I'm not going back. I'm moving ahead. I'm here to declare to you my past is over in you all things are made new surrender my life to christ i'm moving moving forward yeah yes said i'm
follow you, yeah. Oh, forward. Everybody sing it again, sing. You make all things new, yes. You make all things new, and I will follow you forward, yeah. Lift your hands to the Lord if you're thankful for making you new. Yes, we bless your name, Lord God. Oh, we will follow you forward. Hallelujah. At this time, we're going to put a reflection question up to allow you to just meditate on before we bring the word. God bless you. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. It is so good to be in fellowship uh, this morning with the saints and uh, here physically in Lansdowne, Pennsylvania, but also uh, remotely wherever you are in the world. And um, I've been thinking about different ways in delivering the word of God. 
And one of the things, uh, when you have all the answers as believers in Jesus Christ, believe that we do, uh, we sometimes forget to have conversations. And conversations are very, very important. Uh, it is so important that we enter uh, conversations. And I, uh, there is a man that I have a lot of conversations with. They're not all spiritual either. Uh, we talk a lot about the Sixers, what we're going to do with Ben Simmons. And uh, I've softened on Ben Simmons. I've softened. Uh, Pastor Stacy has uh, convicted me about softness and forgiveness uh, concerning Ben Simmons and his uh, kind of um, his uh, psychotic ability not to shoot. Uh, but uh, and uh, yeah, he's a little psychotic about shooting. And we've talked about the, the Eagles. Uh, they won the Super Bowl way back in the olden days of 2018 when we was close up together around the steps of the art museum. And I want you to know this man is a transplant to, to New York, Brooklyn, New York in particular, uh, and yet he came all the way down for the parade. So this morning, Rasul Berry uh, is a native Philadelphian and a real Philadelphian. Uh, he has not drifted in false doctrine and apostasy. Uh, into the New York Giants, uh, or he would not be here this morning, I'm going to tell you, if he cheered for the New York Giants, but he cheers for the Eagles and knows more about them most of the time than even I do. Uh, Rasul Berry, um, uh, do you remember how we met Rasul? I believe we met. Uh, yeah, make sure you got your mic on. Check. Yeah, I, I believe we met through... Uh, Second Antioch Baptist Church. Nah, that ain't no? how we met. He don't know. He's younger than me and don't have as good a memory as I do. That ain't nah, that ain't how we met. We met in missions. I can't remember exactly. Uh, Russell Berry used to work with uh, Campus Crusade for Christ, which has become crew, and a particular division of that called Impact uh, that was aimed at African Americans and people of color on American campuses uh, to win them with the gospel and um, and so you had just maybe graduated from University of Penn, maybe? Yeah, and there, I was raising support, uh -huh. and there was a missions team at the church that I was at, and they one of the folks recommended I reach out to you. Oh, so you came into contact with me yeah. at Second Antioch Baptist Church. Yes, I was there, and they said, you should talk to Pastor James. Wow, He's a church, isn't that a something? So we've been mission. supporting this brother over the years as a missionary, on uh, on college campuses, and he's done all kinds of things. He's managed uh, uh, a singing group and rap group, and he's done all kinds of things creatively. But uh, tell us a little bit about what you're up to now. Yeah, so I wear a couple hats right now. Uh, I serve as a teaching pastor in Brooklyn, New York, at a church plant called The Bridge. Uh, we are seven years old, and uh, mostly our average age is about 27 years wow, old. Wow. Turns out our church. That's and exciting. So, in yeah. Brooklyn, New York, yeah. mind you. Yeah. yeah. In addition to that, I also serve as the director of content development and partnership uh, engagement with our Daily Bread Ministries. Many of y'all might know them through the little booklets with the nice right. little scenic pictures on right, it. Right, right. Well, they, we do a whole lot more than that. Um, yeah. We're launching a podcast next month uh, with them called Where You're From, where mm -hmm. we have conversations wow. with wow. people that, about faith and culture. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done a, a, a documentary series that had me travel all over the world called mm. In Pursuit of Jesus Wow, and, uh, and other things like that. And that we still write, too, with, with them as well. So a lot of couples. So things. our Daily Bread has been in a lot of what's been in our lobby. Uh, it has been in a lot of bathrooms. Like if you want to meet Jesus, <laughs> the best place to read Daily Bread is in the bathroom, because you got to go in there well, sooner or later. And so uh, old ladies have it on their coffee table next to their favorite chair. And you said something very interesting about Daily Bread as it relates to black folks. What was that? Yeah, we talked earlier. Uh, uh, when I first started engaging with them in the ministry, I discovered that 30% of their readership and subscribers are African American. That's amazing. Yeah, considering we're only 13% we're only 13 of, the, of population. the population. So, yeah. yeah. So that is an amazing thing. It's exciting that in this uh, very evangelical, more white environment, mm -hmm. uh, that a brother, a black brother like you, you're quite dark. And uh, you got dreads and everything. And uh, here you are. How, why would they let a brother with dreads in such an evangelical institution as our Daily Bread? 
you know, I think this really relates to what we're going to be discussing in terms of just how we engage culture. And uh, there's really two different responses you can have to the reality of a changing demographic of America, the reality of a changing conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's either a sense of frustration and resistance against that or an, a realization that I ne we need to embrace yeah. uh, this new wave and, and come in with the times and try to stretch ourselves in that direction. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, our daily bread has chosen the latter, so they realize you know, there's some things that you bring mm -hmm. to the table that you know, we don't currently have that we want to kind of lean into and reach into mm -hmm. uh, you know, a more diverse and younger community. So uh, it was a good fit. So that is so exciting to me that you, uh, an Ivy League graduate, one of my favorite schools is University of Penn. Uh, they have a sense of mission, and they are the largest employer in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, and so you have that rich heritage there. Your name is Rasul. How'd you become Rasul? That ain't no Christian name. Nah, Where did nah. you get that from? Uh, my parents had joined the Nation of Islam before I was born. Uh, and so my full name is Rasul. I mean Akbar Barry. So you're like a mongrel. You're a Christian. <laughs> you're a Christian mutt. You got a little, uh, little uh, Nation of Islam, a little Christian, a little, yeah. So tell us more. So how did you come to faith? So after being raised in it a little bit, I mean, we pretty much drifted into secularism. Mm. Um, and so I would have probably considered myself maybe an agnostic, you know, in high wow. school. Wow, wow, And wow. Um, But what happened was God got my attention yeah. the way he often does among teenagers, which is through relationships. So wow. I wow. found myself in a scenario where I was trying to be a player mm. and had two girlfriends at the same time. Wow. And I learned through this experience, you can't be a player if you ain't got game. So I got caught. Yeah. Oh, um, oh. And, you you uh, can preach that. You can't be a player if you don't have game. Yeah. Somebody say amen. Man, he preaching already. Go <laughs> ahead. He going to preach this morning. Go ahead. So um, so the, the, the girl that confronted me, she said, you know, you're no better than other guys. In fact, you, you're worse because you think you're better than them. Wow. And... Wow. Uh, and that just is what God used to kind of mm. shatter. Because she was absolutely right. I yeah. had this kind of moralistic self-righteousness about uh, me, yeah. even though I was secular. But I was like, I don't drink. I don't yeah. cuss. I'm respectful. I get good grades. So yeah. based on my resume, I'm better than my peers. Wow. But what I realized was yeah. sometimes you don't get credit for not doing stuff that you don't have access to do. Right. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, right. I just, this is because I didn't have access to be a player didn't mean that <laughs> I should get credit for treating women. Right, but, right. So, but when it, when the rubber hit the road and I was in the same situation, I did the same thing. Wow. Yeah. So then I just decided to confess to the, you know, other girl. And, uh, and she said, I forgive you. Wow. And I was confused because I had just gotten chewed out and I was like, why? And she said, well, Jesus has forgiven me for everything that I've done. So I don't think I should hold it against you. Wow. And... That was like, I didn't, first of all, I was blown away by that yeah. response, and yeah. I didn't understand it. Yeah. And I was like, so tell me more about this <laughs> and how mm. this works. So she started inviting me to church, and uh, I started hearing the gospel. I wouldn't say for the first time, but with new ears. Right. Because before I had a pride about me that made me think, I don't need this religious stuff. This is just people yeah. who need a crutch to mm. live on. And, and so I, I really dismissed it. Mm. But the second time around when I was aware of my own sin condition, I was aware of how uh, I wasn't, I didn't meet up to my own standards, right. let alone God's. Yeah. Yeah, I, I listened with new ears and heard the gospel and really um, was like, man, Jesus has given all this to me and all I got to do is just kind of live for him and he, he will help me know how to live. Right. You know what I mean? And so that's what started the journey. That was right when freshman year started on campus. And so my faith journey and my, you know, academic journey kind of w went side by so side. So it seems like your faith, how you came to faith in Jesus Christ was not in a traditional sense in a pew of a church. Well, that experience is what got me on the way. And then I went to a church mm -hmm. and I was like, when they did the, you know, they did, this was a Baptist church, yeah. you know, and so you had to stand up. St. Joseph's Baptist St. Joseph Baptist Church, yeah. 40th and Sampson at the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I was like, I, I felt like this clear compelling of the spirit to move forward. But I'm like, I'm not walking in front of all these people. Right. So uh, so I ended up talking to one of the ministers afterwards. He led me in a prayer and 
got baptized and been running ever since. So it's interesting that you kind of came to faith outside of the church, but then that was nurtured yeah. in the context of, context of a local uh, black Baptist church. But you are anything but a traditional yeah. uh, Christian. Uh, in fact, you know, for many years, I have had a kind of mentoring relationship. He's really my son. And he, uh, and Rasul Berry is a son of Careview. He has just never gone here, that's all. But I have spent quite a bit of time nurturing and kind of mentoring this man. Uh, and um, he has just developed uh, so beautifully in that just a few years ago, you didn't even want to be called a minister because you thought that was just too confining and <laughs> too, uh, it wasn't cool enough really. That's really, he ain't, he was afraid he wasn't going to be cool if he was a minister. I said, so why, why aren't you a minister? We had this long discussion and now he's a made man. He's like an elder and uh, he's a pastor in his church. Tell me about your journey of grappling with the traditional modalities of church yeah. When clearly from the very beginning you were called, mm -hmm. not just to the church, but to the world, yeah. and uh, you didn't want to miss your calling. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, I really started to grow spiritually in college, and it was this almost like a relay race. We just watched, you know, the Olympics. We won't talk about the men's relay 100, but, yeah, we won't talk um, but the idea of the relay is, you know, one passes it to the next, and I really felt like my friend passed it to the church, and then they pass it to a parachurch ministry, and I started getting involved with campus ministry. Right. And that really opened my eyes to the world and the realization that living out your faith wasn't just something that should look like what you do on Sunday or in right. the four walls or, or going to whatever is happening at the church, but it's what it looks like for you to live out there. Mm -hmm. And so that was the primary framework that I had for growing, and that really developed, but then I kind of would say I got it in balance, though, over mm -hmm. through that and thought mm -hmm. that that was the majority or all that there was. And, and honestly, what happened, uh, so at this point, I was living in Indiana, uh, doing music ministry, as you mentioned, and, and that space kind of collapsed around me for various reasons. And when it did, all I had left was the church that I was going to and started mm -hmm. to yeah. be involved in, you know, teaching Sunday schools and things like that. And what I think... I learned from that, and I think this was a word, you know, for all of us, is mm. one of the unique things that made the church more stable mm. was its intergenerational community yeah. context. Yeah. Like, so the fact that I, there were people there that were teenagers, there were, you know, young parents, older parents, grandparents, all of that, it was, I was more than just the one thing that I had been in a kind right. of parachurch environment. Yeah. Yeah. And so that caused me to realize that I needed to be more intentional about plugging into the, what the, ch the local church, which is kind of God's vehicle for changing the world. At, around that same time, he was also showing us that our time in Indiana was coming to an end. And so uh, reconnected with a friend of mine from college who we had actually started the journey in campus ministry together at Howard University uh, full time. And he had started this church in uh, New York City for those who were disaffected by church. Wow. And uh, So this church is for people that have had church hurt and yes. have been disaffected a by church. church for people that don't like church. Yeah, so what is that like? What is that? <laughs> I'm intrigued because a lot of my people here this morning don't like church all that much. <laughs> uh, so help me understand what that looks like. Yeah, I think um, for starters, there's a heavy emphasis on authenticity. And, of course, the two yeah. of those things aren't necessarily unrelated, but yeah. there is a tendency when something becomes more institutional and, and, yeah. and, and rigid that yeah. there's a, a certain way of, presenting oneself that people just start to not be able to relate to. Yeah. And so that's when we get into the formality, even of dress, you know yeah. what I mean? And even right. of what I look like on Sunday and all this. Right. And so uh, we were very intentional about just even from on stage being more casual, our worship team, all that. The other thing was doing art in, in, at a high level. And mm. so uh, making sure that the worship experience was something, especially because you know, with the age group that we were targeting, I mean, you know, they're not, they used to, what they're used to listening to in the music wise yeah, is on a high level. It can't be whack. Yeah, it can't and be so, whack. And um, so, so that also was a really driving factor to make, you know, the art and not just the worship, but even the design elements. So I love this like ignite dynamic and, right. you know, so even our visuals, the visual story. Doesn't that get messy when you have a bunch of folk in church that don't like church? 
and start asking hard questions and yes. questioning the leadership? Absolutely. How do you navigate through uh, you know, diversity of thought? Because black folk, I'm assuming your church is predominantly African American. Yeah, but we it, we're getting pretty diverse. Yeah, too. that's good. Yeah. So, um, so what do you do? But even amongst the African American community, there's great diversity of perspective. Yeah. Uh, you got people in different lifestyles and right. walks that come with their questions. How do you navigate that through the bridge, which is a phenomenal name for a church, mm -hmm. the bridge? Right. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, and that is the name is a reminder to us of what we intend to be, a bridge between God and people, between, you know, faith and, and maybe a lack of faith or, dis, right. you know, uh, de-churched, as we say. Because there's unchurched people right. who never don't know about Jesus, never been around. Exactly. Then there's de-churched people. De-churched. De churched is right. even different because that's like, oh, I know this. I've been around, but something happened in so that environment that, that hurt So it's good to say that the church is the best at de-churching themselves. Oh, <laughs> Excellent. You know, we drive folk off. We abort yes. just as many babies as we birth, if not yeah, more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it becomes really important to what you emphasize and select. So, for example, mm. you know, someone comes in and they might be dressed in a way that's pretty provocative, or mm -hmm. you know, like in the old days, you know, in certain environments today. Yeah. The priority is covering that person. Yeah, up. the mother of the church. Yeah, they'll come up and you know. Right, yeah. because that is seen as a primary value. Right. Whereas yeah. it's like if I'm really trying, if that's who I'm trying to reach, mm -hmm. then I maybe that's not the main important thing. Maybe the main thing wow. is actually engaging with the internal. Yes. Right. Man looks right. on the outside, God yes. looks at the heart, right. and actually engaging that way, right. and then bringing that person along a process of discipleship right. where they get to see something different. Yes. And and that's those are the choices mm -hmm. that we make that makes it look different right. than, and be, people just feel comfortable being right. there and they don't feel judged. Yeah. And so, yeah, those are some of the things. Mm -hmm. But it also means patience with mm -hmm. people who are a bit more critical and yeah. outspoken about right. that criticalness and, yeah. and just realizing, you know, I'm going I'm to I'm be patient and go along that journey with you. Right. That's wonderful. What, what would you say about the cultural moment that we're living in right now? Uh, I know that's an expansive question, yeah. but in as pointed a sense as you can, Tell us what your observations are, because you're kind of a sociological practitioner now, yeah. uh, and you're doing that for Daily Bread. Uh, you know, what would you say about uh, the uh, cultural uh, situation that we're in right now, sure. particularly in America and abroad? Can, can I frame it biblically first for a sure second? Sure you can. Because, I, and the reason why I think that's an important place to start is already we get ourselves in a, offset when we begin to think that we're the only ones who've ever experienced a certain thing. Right. And it becomes very anxious and disorienting. Yeah. But as I was preparing for this time and I was going back and, you know, I mentioned uh, when I started to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, hmm. and it says that uh, the sons of Issachar who joined with David, that they knew the times and understood what to do. You meant 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles. What, I said yeah. Corinthians? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, 1 yeah, yeah, Chronicles. Uh-huh. And when you look at the context of First Chronicles, what you see is, I mean, it's funny. We look at this stuff and we forget the, the emotional context because we're so used to the story of Saul and David. Right, right. But, all right, yeah, so the people of God demand a king. Hmm. We want a king. Samuel's like, no, don't do this. We want a king. Samuel, the prophet, think, no, we want a king to be like the other nations. Right. So God tells Samuel, go ahead, let them get a king. He picks Saul, tallest of all of them. Use what you want, a visual representation of your strength. So they're like, yes, we finally have a king like everyone else. And uh, he's anointed, you know, and he goes out, but then he starts making really bad decisions. God rejects this administration and selects David. Now, we know that backstory, but if you're one of the people in Israel, all you know is there is now an instability in the land because there's one monarch who you looked at and who set this up as from an administration standpoint and who's a leader that you don't have trust in anymore. And then there's this young guy who's coming up saying that, you know, and the word on the street is that he's the new king. He ain't related to Saul, so this ain't the way how it's supposed to work right. through a hereditary monarchy. What do you do in that moment? This unrest, there's instability. Wow. And so what ended up happening in that First Chronicles chapter 12 is it lists all the different tribal leaders and who responded and, were, and saw that even though Saul was technically in this position, that ultimately was actually David who God's hand was on. 
And the reason why I bring that up as a kind of backdrop for where we are now is because in these days, it can be very disorienting. We had an administration who says that there was an illegitimate you know, election, and so there's even rivalry that happens in our own land in terms of what people think of who should be in office and who shouldn't. And in the midst of that instability and that cultural flux, what do you do and how do you understand? Well, we have to be like the sons of Issachar who understood the times and know what to do. And a key component of that looks like saying, okay, there is a time in which is also an increasing secularization. We feel like that's a new thing, people abandoning faith. Well, if you go back and look at Chronicles, you see that people had already been abandoning the God of Yahweh for other gods around them. This isn't new. Um, so what is the kind of guiding light or our North Star, what it can be moving forward, is understanding the times and recognizing that, yes, there is an increasing sense of distrust in institutions and authority, because like a Saul, we had a Saul in leadership, you know what I mean, right. that, that destabilized things. Yeah. Um, that there is a sense of people looking for other answers spiritually, other than what they have found in the walls of the temple or the church yeah. in our context. And what do we do about it? And I think that there's the going back to the two versions of what you can do when you hit those cultural you know, headwinds. You can either get fearful, and which causes you to like lock up and close up, or you can get faithful, mm -hmm. which looks like being trusting God and seeing opportunities instead of just seeing threats. Interesting. And I think that's the decision that we make every morning when we wake up. I can look at, it reminds me of when the uh, 12 spies went out um, you know, to spy out the land. Mm -hmm. And they all, like, the ones that we don't realize is that the 10 who said it's a good land, but these, di you know, these giants out there are all around and we look like grasshoppers in their eyes. It's funny, they were saying what the other people saw them as. You right. know, like they assumed that. Mm -hmm. But the point is, the, uh, they were telling a story that was not inaccurate on its face. They gave accurate information. The problem was they also gave interpretation of that information that said, therefore, we can't do this. Right. Whereas Caleb and Joshua, same information, but said, it's a good land. God has given it to us. Wow. He set us up. We can go. Wow. And that's the question that's before us as a church is, are we going to see it like the 10 who said, we got to retreat, wow. or the two who say, we got to move forward? That is a word from the Lord this morning that we can see the divisiveness of our culture, but not participate in it, uh, as sometimes we do. And sometimes we're divisive in the name of Jesus, uh, which is a misnomer. So what, what, what do you make of, in light of the murder of George Floyd uh, last year, what do you make of the racial reckoning that seems to be going on in our culture, um, uh, and particularly around the idea of CRT? Which, so yeah. deal with the first part of that question. So the racial reckoning, um, and it's an interesting concept because in one sense, black folk been reckoning with race yeah. our entire lives. Like right. that, it wasn't yeah. new. Yeah, ain't nothing new. But what, you know, I'm old enough to remember Rodney Floyd. I mean Rodney, Rodney Floyd, King. Rodney King. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. connecting the two names because it's like the, my mind is like seeing yeah. the same thing. Yeah, right. But I'm old enough to remember right. what I thought was outrageous and could never happen, right? right? That these police officers who clearly beat this man, you know, savagely could be acquitted. Um, I'm, you know, of course, then there was, you know, it was just fast forwarding uh, to Trayvon Martin, yes. you know, Sandra Bland, right. Mike Brown, and, yes. uh, and there, but there was a, 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 a flashpoint that happened where people get to a place of, we can't take this no more, like this, this, is, this is it. Yeah. And so there was a moment of uh, the reckoning of we refuse to allow this to be normal. Do you think the pandemic contributed Absolutely. to it? Yeah. Absolutely, I think the, the kind, a, a pandemic which also mm -hmm. had a, a racial uh, layer to it because yeah. that it uh, evoked and exposed the inequalities that exist in our healthcare system, yes. that exist, I mean, in New York City, for example, they, they mapped this out. So, you know, we were hit incredibly hard with it and when you saw in Manhattan, in the Upper East Side and Upper West Side, like half of the population left the city. Hmm. Whereas in Brooklyn, which was hit even harder, most people stay because they don't have the means. They don't got a spot up in Martha's Vineyard. They right. don't have a spot, you know, to just go right. in Aspen and just go, you know, we're just going to yeah. work, you know. So all of those things. And then who had to be the frontline workers who were, you know, working at the supermarkets and driving people's cars and stuff. So, so yeah, there was a, a, a increased exposure with that, the, the sense of social I isolation. 
you know, what I realized when we led a protest, we led a massive uh, a protest in uh, through our church in June of 2020, and I recognized there was a form of therapy hmm. in coming together and yeah. just saying, you know, there's a sense of solidarity that you can even feel more alienated from when because of the pandemic. So I do think think that both of those are related. Mm -hmm. So what ended up in those, and you can't talk about the CRT hysteria without talking about George Floyd. Right. Because what happens is, I mean, you might not realize this, that summer 2020 was the largest protest movement in our nation's history. Yes. Not, I mean, including the 60s. Yes. Like, n that never before have we seen that many numbers of people yes. coming out. There's a whole lot of white folk marching, too. Oh, a whole lot. Yeah, whole at our lot. church, I mean, at our protests at the church, it was a diverse, uh, evangelical, like Asian, wow. Hispanic, white, you know, they were, you know, mm -hmm. in significant numbers. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, everybody changed their tune. The, mm -hmm. the NFL, who was used to get, to get you know, protests, we sorry, we, we about, you know, black lives, everything NASCAR. changed. NASCAR. Everything. <laughs> NASCAR, right. Yeah. But there also is a backlash to that. There's always a black, a back, a black lash. A black lash. Yeah. <laughs> There's always a black lash uh -huh. to when progress happens. Right. And so people try to interpret their world with the same narrative that they've always had. And so they're looking at this on TV, seeing these folks out in the streets and going, well, we are already committed to the perspective that there's nothing wrong with our world and our society and that this is God's land and that, you know, right. this is, you know. So it can't be that there's something wrong. It must be some other reason right. that these folks are coming together. Interesting. I know it. It's this ideology that has crept into uh -huh. society that's really Marxist in its base, the boogeyman of Karl Marx that continues to capture the imagination, and that's why. So when we look at CRT, CRT stands for critical race theory. Right. How would you briefly define yeah. CRT? Yeah, and I'll, anytime I speak about this, I always mention there's two versions uh -huh. of CRT. There's the actual version, and then there's the boogeyman that is what oftentimes you see talked about in particular. Start with the boogeyman and then okay. get the accurate one. Yeah. So the boogeyman version of critical race theory is a worldview designed to destroy America hmm. by dividing people among race and essentially saying white people are innately evil for being white and that black and brown people should therefore take over because hmm. we're not as evil like they are. Right. That's essentially their version. Yes. Um, the actual version is Basically, a way. Well, if you look at the history, what happened was Derek Bell, who was considered the um, kind of founder of critical race theory, he was a NAACP lawyer, legal activist, who was helping with, when Brown versus Board of Education was decided in 1954 and made separate but equal doctrine, you know, illegal. And said there is no separate but equal. We have to have integration in our public institutions. Most activists thought that this was going to be the silver bullet that created the equality in our society. So fast forward 20 years later, he's Harvard law professor in Boston where there's still fights happening over busing and he's trying to figure out, well, why didn't this work? We thought that this was gonna work. And so instead of doing what I would say a whack-a-mole version of understanding race, which basically finding uh, a racist law and then going after that law and trying to change that law. Right. Yes. What he and other theorists realized was we have to actually understand that this is baked into the entire legal system. Wow. It's not just a law here and a law there. It's actual the framework was based in a in a racialized context with, with right. racist results at its core desired. Yes. And so at that way we have to approach this thing systemically, we have to see that there is a systematic problem and we have to address it. And so in that way, that's what critical race theory is a way of, it's a theory to explain how racism became so pervasive in our society and the caste system was able to be created that when you look at every outcome versus education, financial wealth, uh, criminal justice, any scenario, housing, you see these disparities at place. And so critical race theory says it's not just about a, a bad law somewhere in the books that you gotta find, but it's a it's a it's beyond that. It's the both legal but also social practices that cause people to kind of perpetuate the system. And it turns on its ear the mythology that America is a Christian nation. Yeah. And that it's one nation under God and indivisible. Yes. You know, uh, and you know, sometimes patriotism can be a kind of phenomenon that if I'm critical in any way, yeah. that I'm no longer patriotic. Yeah. But really the highest 
form of patriotism is when I critique my uh, nation and examine uh, my nation. So why is it the evangelicals seem to have such a violent response yeah. to it? Many of the uh, biggest evangelical voices have written against it, made yes. statements against it. Uh, some of them forbid critical race theory being taught um, uh, in school districts. There yeah. are people, up, parents up in arms. I don't want critical race theory yeah. uh, taught. I don't want to wear my children wear no masks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's kind of goes together. But tell me about why there is such pushback, particularly in the evangelical Bible believing yes. com community, who has a yeah. mandate of compassion yep. through the person of Jesus. Remember when we started talking about David and Saul and the issue of idolatry. Right. Of people. And what but what they did was they didn't just most people in Israel, when you look at the history of idolatry, they didn't just reject the God of Yahweh in terms of conceptually and just start embracing idols. What they did was a form of syncretism. Mm -hmm. Syncretism is when you combine two things and say, oh, no, 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 no. We still we still rock with God. We still go to the temple, but we also got our idols on the side that we worship. And that's similar to what's happening, and, and it was ha has happened with uh, many mainstream evangelical church churches and Christians, is that there's a sense of, oh, yeah, we still believe the Bible. We, we still hold to that. But there's this idol of Christian nationalism, this wow. mythology of uh, which basically believes that God, there was, he, he worked with Israel, then he did a, a, a remix, a sequel, and decided to touch and bless America in a certain way. And so, therefore... The founding fathers replaced the disciples, and, uh, and, and now you can't touch this. This is holy land. This is holy ground. And that narrative and that mythology is something that, this is why they were so mad about the 1619 Project. Right. Because they want to start the story at 1776. Look at our resistance against tyranny and what happened. And so you got a project that says, actually, if you want to really understand America in this full context, you got to look at when the first slaves were brought in from Africa. And that, that framework, which pre-exists pre 1776, actually gives you more context. Well, you don't have founding fathers without 1619. Right. All of the wealth of George Washington and the wealth of yes. Thomas Jefferson yes. is based upon slavery, right. which is the number one wealth maker in the history of the United States through this moment. Right. So and how do you ignore the enormous right. sociological and economic impact of that? So the contradiction of that narrative with the one that they wanted to hold on to has created a deep reaction. And if you want to see people get upset, mess with the idols. So it seems like there is a fight. There's a fight for the soul of evangelicalism. Yeah. Evangelicalism meaning that I have a high view of scripture, that I feel it is my role uh, to uh, win people to Christ, and that I embody the spirit of Christ and the person of Christ in my deportment. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the soul of that is is uh, is uh, being warred, yes. you know, uh, for it. Listen, I need to go to a lightning round because I can't keep y'all long. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, I'm going to ask you this. What, what should be our posture right now towards the LGBTQ movement as Christians? How should we view the LGBTQ community as Christians, uh, you both are not. Both of us identify as evangelicals, yeah. for better or for worse. Right. Uh, and we have a high view of Scripture. We want to mm. embody the person of Christ. We want people to be born again and have a relationship with Jesus. How should I view that social phenomenon? Yeah, I think again, going back to the two types of responses that one could have: one of fear or one of faith. Yeah. That is the kind of first decision I have to make, right? If right. you know, how do I respond to a society or world that has rejected the standards or vision of human sexuality or human humanity that I have and have embraced another one, um, I can even re react viscerally, angrily, and try to you know, fight back in that sense. Or I could react like what I think the God of the Bible reacts, which is with a sense of compassion and engagement. Right. So I think about, for example, um, the way Jesus interacted with the woman at the well, right. you know, where he has this conversation. She's a Samaritan, so she's outside of the Jewish people. She has bad theology. Uh, she worships in the wrong place. She has a history and all those things. But first of all, the fact that Jesus decided to go to Samaria, go to her, he did where most Jews, most religious people went away. And then on top of that, he decided to engage her in conversation as opposed to telling her all that she was wrong or what they thought. Wow. 
that was a paradigm shift and made her an incredible evangelist. Wow. And I think in the same way wow. that the evangelical church wow. has done such a disservice in alienating people that they don't even understand fully, that we have a terrible history. If you go back to the AIDS crisis and the accusations that it was a gay plague, this was God's judgment, and just all this sort of just hurt that has come across mm -hmm. because of people just being bad people to each other, like not even yeah. loving, right. that that has been the, we, there's a whole lot we have to undo in just in being able to uh, engage and share in, 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 in a loving way. Yeah, so it sounds like you're, you know, we can't, because we've had this kind of hands off. Yeah. Uh, idea towards the LGBTQ community, yeah. and uh, meanwhile, we got folks shacking up in the church uh, and knocking boots and doing all kind of stuff. Right. But then we identify that particular uh, sin or lifestyle right. and try to kind of marginalize it. So it sounds like you're saying that we should engage people, yes. regardless of what their right. background is. And yeah, and then the other thing is, I, I think there's an important distinction, and this is where I, I've thought about this a lot, the rub is, is that beyond, beyond the cultural noise where we don't have a lack of credibility, we don't have moral authority in the society because of the poor mistreatment. But the other thing is the distinction between behavior in, in identity. Hmm. And that's where there is a rub where hmm. I, I, it's okay for me to disagree with somebody that says that they see themselves as a core part of identity of who they're attracted to. But I just don't think that that's biblical across the board. Like, we're souls. Who I'm attracted to or who I, how I see myself, am I embodied in the right gender or not, neither of those things I think are actually of utmost importance to God. Wow. And so why are we prioritizing wow. something that is actually lower on the scale of importance than God sees it himself? So, so it's almost like we uh, hitch it to behaviors mm -hmm. that when we see someone that differs from us in the perspective of sexuality or gender orientation, that we link it to a behavior that we are appalled by. Right. And therefore, we reject the person. I got to move on from that. But that's good, man. I, would, I want you to just stay there. <laughs> Um, what about the Me Too movement? How should we look at the Me Too movement as uh, followers of Christ? Well, you know, as uh, a New Yorker right now, our governor is looking oh, at yeah. being um, got a naughty governor up there. impeached uh, hey, because of a history of 11 different accounts that the attorney general in her uh, investigation found were all plausible, yeah. uh, that he sexually harassed women on his staff, right. a woman that was you know, protecting him as a state trooper, wow. touching her yeah. stomach and her leg and right. yeah. people's breasts and all I mean, all yeah. And so mm -hmm. um, there's a real uh, reality to, you know, sexual assault that has not been taken seriously mm. enough, even in the church and in yeah. society. Yeah. And the idea of listening to people who don't normally, aren't normally listened to, I think the two of those things are related mm. to both the issue you know, we, we just got finished talking about in terms of sexuality and gender, but also in terms of sexual assault. And, I, and this is the tough part, is like when I'm in a position as a man where I, I don't necessarily have to listen, like from a societal standpoint, like I'm kind of considered a certain way, right. I have to follow the model of Jesus who humbled himself and yeah. became a servant right. and actually exchanged his privilege for serving those who didn't have it to Would you say them. some of the patriarchy of the church can create some of the dilemmas that women face in church? Absolutely. In terms of an environment where they can either not be listened to or they can be improperly touched or commented towards. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, say a little bit about that in terms of how some of the, I don't know if it's a hidden patriarchy or whether it is just an assumed patriarchy, meaning that men are in charge. Men are in charge. We run this and we just let y'all come and give <laughs> and serve and run our church. Uh, uh, so do you think that, uh, Fiza, speak to that a little bit. Yeah, uh, you know, someone who's really helped me understand this, uh, she's a professor um, named Carolyn Custis James. She's an uh, author. She wrote a great book called The Gospel of Ruth. Wow. Uh, where she wow. did a, a full study of the book of Ruth wow. and kind of showed the gospel <laughs> insights from it um, wow. and also half the church. But one of the things, she wrote a book about men too called Maelstrom and looked wow. at, you know, but the, in that book, she said one of the big misnomers is that patriarchy is the message of the Bible. Hmm. And what she says is actually 
patriarchy is the cultural context through which the Bible shares and shows its its holy righteous critique of it. Wow. Most profoundly throughout, and and, and it was like wow. this sixth sense moment where I kind of went back and looked, and I said, because wow. he asked, why does he was why does God continually wow. challenge primogenitor, the idea that the wow. oldest son should have all the power wow. given from the father? Wow. It's like when you go back and look, Cain and Abel from the very beginning. Wow. You know, wow. the older kills the younger. You go Preach, to, brother. you know what I mean? I, you know, just the twins, right? right. Esau, why, why does the younger one get the blessing and not the older one? Right. What, what is this all about? The and ultimately, son. the prodigal son, <laughs> the, the, the younger one, there's this continual push against this system, wow. this critique of it. Yes. And ultimately, we see it in Jesus, the firstborn, who, what does he do? Give his life wow. for, the, for, the, for those who didn't deserve it. Yeah. And so there's this, this continual, subtle, but prolific critique of patriarchy in the scripture wow. and that we have missed because mm. the culture has been more dominated by a culture from right. outside of the yes. biblical framework that's yes. kind of been sanctified, oh, you so know, good. versus what the Bible actually teaches. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. Boy, I tell you, you a smart Negro. I'm going to tell you, you smart Negro. Wow, man. What, what is your understanding of apologetics, apologia? In, is a is a real central idea, particularly First Peter three fifteen. Uh, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. Um, does the, does Christianity need to be defended in the twenty first century? See, that's a, those are two different questions. So he he <laughs> likes to do this. Anybody get in a conversation with Pastor James and he throw you good questions, you be like, uh, uh, can I call a friend? Um, <laughs> <laughs> no lifelines. No lifelines. <laughs> so. Apologetics or has to do with, it, it literally means a defense of the faith. But it's different to engage in apologetics than to feel like Christianity has to be defended. You know, I like the way C.S. Lewis put it where he said, you don't have to defend a lion, you just let it out of its cage. You know what I mean? Like, I don't have to defend Jesus. He's Lord of everything. And his, the reality of who he is is self-evident in yes, all sir. of creation yes, and in my own life, right? Uh, but humanity suppresses the truth, it, you know, Paul says in Romans. And so as a result of that, what I see my job is, and as an apologist, is not um, trying to argue and have to try to fight for God because he can't handle himself and he got bullied on a schoolyard <laughs> by some atheist named Richard Dawkins. Like, that ain't, that ain't what's going on. What is actually going on is I am trying to help someone take away the obstacles that prevent them from seeing the glory of God that Ooh. we talked about. Oh. And the glory of God can be overlooked and obscured just like the clouds in the sky can obscure the sun based on various personal issues often that we have. That going back to hurt in the church, somebody hurt you, hurt in life. I was just uh, telling Pastor James about a conversation we had at a restaurant. I had at a restaurant a couple weeks ago. And the uh, hostess at the restaurant saw that she under she she knew our lead pastor and was talking and she kind of does that thing that oftentimes people do when they see pastors. Say, I'm gonna go back to church. I'm I'm gonna get it together. You know, we just like yo, we just was chilling. But, right. um, <laughs> but what she ended up disclosing was her her mother had been a minister who was a strong evangelist, and um and what was the turning point of when she stopped going to church? This young lady was. A month before she was going to graduate from Spelman, her mom passed away of cancer wow. that she had been praying about for years and mm. fighting. And she just couldn't understand and wrap her head around how God could let someone that was so faithful to him mm. die wow. when there's all these unrighteous people that she could yeah. see that were living. And, and in that moment, I think it's important to understand apologetics, again, has to go more to the heart than the head. Yes. You know, I can sure I could talk about the presence of evil and all this stuff in, in, the, in the world. But at, at the end of the day, I needed to listen, empathize with her and just share. Perhaps there's a, a, something you can't see. There's an angle yeah. that, 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 that you're wow. missing wow. that maybe by drawing closer to God with yeah. your pain, yeah. you can maybe the, the see. Exquisite, yeah. The exquisite nature of your answer, Russell, is that you didn't give an answer. Right. But you created deeper questions right. that perhaps there's something you can't see that God is up to. Our time is winding down, and I want to ask you about active listening uh, and empathic interactions that we can have with people in the culture that is modeled in, in Christ. Um, you, you, you talked about uh, um, this idea of engaging in the cultural conversation. And you, you, you said something very interesting a little while ago to me about software 
uh, hardware and middleware. Can you say a little bit about that, yeah. about how we engage the culture? Yeah, so oftentimes when we have theological conversations or we try to think about how do I live biblically, we go to two places. We go, okay, what do I know is true about God? What do I believe? And so therefore, what do I do, right? Mm -hmm. What do I believe? What do I do? And often when we have these debates even about CRT or the cultural conversation and race and justice and sexuality, and gen like that seems to be, well, I believe this, so I do this, right? right. I, you know, I, I believe God is holy and good, and so therefore that means I got to cuss out people who or, or reject people who, who don't believe like I do. But what we miss is this thing in the middle called middleware, mm. right? Mm. So middleware is, a, is, 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 so in So say that again, computer, software would mean what? Software is the theology. My theology. That's what runs the device, right? right. Like, you know, I got yeah. an iPhone. Got you know, you have an operating system, the software that is built that runs. Right. That's the idea. And the hardware would be is the phone itself that allows you to access the software and to actually. But do as what it you relates do. to faith, software is my theology. What hardware, is hardware is what I do. How what I, I practice. Do how I based live. Based on out. what I believe. Yes. So, what is the middleware of of Christianity? Middleware is really important. It's what uh, Tim Keller uh, calls. A theological vision. Mm. Um, a theological vision is almost like a take. Mm. It's like That's it, it's it's a it's a interpret. It's understanding the times and knowing what to do. That's beautiful. Because the reality is, there's 66 books. There's thousands of verses. Yeah. I don't live out e execute all of them equally based on a particular day. That's impossible to even think about. Yes. But what I do is I go, okay, in this particular moment and situation, that question, what would Jesus do? is a theological vision question. That's a middleware, wow. You're, you know, because the answer to that, one of my favorite Proverbs, mm. it says, mm -hmm. answer not a fool in his folly, mm -hmm. or you will be like him. Yeah. The next verse says, yeah. answer a fool in his folly, or he will be right in his own eyes. Right. And it's like, well, what, is this contradiction in the Bible? It's like, what's going on? And, it's, okay. and what is he's using is specific, the, it's wisdom. Wisdom. That, that, like, it's saying that depending on the circumstance, mm. the best way to respond to a question or an issue is to not respond at all, mm. to keep it moving. Yeah. You know what I mean? If I'm seeing a bunch of Hebrew Israelites on the corner and they yelling with a microphone and, you know, you know, and they see that I got a Bible with me and it's, hey, Christian, you know, and they, you know, I'm like, this ain't the time, the right. place. You, I'm not going to answer a fool. At the same time, I take that same person who was on that platform, but I see him at the restaurant or the store and he, or in my house and we interacting. Answer a fool in his folly, or he'll be right in his own eyes. Yeah. That's the key of wisdom of understanding. So that's the theological vision yes. that will determine how I move in different spaces. Yeah. So where I want to land with you is, it, could you give us four practical keys yep. for engaging the cultural conversation? Yeah. What are four practical keys yeah. for engaging the cultural conversation? The first thing is, I've read this book, Eva uh, Questioning Evangelism, by a Jewish brother named uh, Randy Newman. And he acknowledged that when you look through the Gospels, Jesus asks over 300 questions in the Gospels. Wow. 300 wow. questions. And he was using a rabbinic approach of wisdom, the way they would just ask questions to each other. And it's something that as Christians we've lost a lot of. So the first one is ask, don't tell. Ask, don't tell. And James 119, you know, it says be slow. Here we go. The verse is right there. Let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Mm -hmm. And so there's an aspect of being quicker to hear than to speak. Someone said, <laughs> God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. Right. You know, it's yeah. kind of, we're supposed to listen twice that's as much than we speak. That's right. Um, so that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. Second is define terms, don't assume. Hmm. And uh, hmm. this is a huge one. So yeah. same thing when I hear the word, so you're, what is your stance on critical race theory? I ask people, well, what do you mean by critical race theory? I don't assume that we have the same ideas in mind um, when we say something. So it's important to define terms. Yeah. Uh, Proverbs 18, 13 says, if one gives an answer before he hears, it is folly and shame. Wow. You know what yeah. I mean? You're answering a question that somebody didn't ask. Mm -hmm. Number three, seek to be a faithful presence rather than winning an argument. This is a very important one in wow. terms of this idea of how do I live in a cultural context in which mm. there's so much pain attached to people's Christian experience. Yeah. Well, maybe if I look to just be faithful, mm. I don't have to kind of come out with a conclusion. And you know what that does is it lowers mm. the temperature mm. and it gives you less pressure because now you don't feel like God is looking at you like, man, if you don't do it right now, it's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, it's just like I'm just going to give you what I have. Um, 
and part of the be able to do that is to love your enemies mm -hmm. and pray for those who persecute you. Mm -hmm. Being a faithful presence means that you're not going to look like you're winning. You might even look like you're losing. But because I love the person more than my desire to win, I'm going to stick it out and be there for them. Yeah. And then the last one is be okay with not knowing, mm -hmm. but do not remain ignorant. This is one of my favorite because you know what some, sometimes the best answer to a question is? I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. I, but you know what? I'm going to be committed to finding out for you, and I'll get back to you. Mm -hmm. That's a much better response than uh, trying to uh, say something and just kind of make it up on the fly and just you know being lost. And it also models a certain sense of humility because sharing our faith is not about presenting ourselves as a better person than other people, going back to the beginning. I came to faith because I thought, I was better than others beforehand, and what the gospel showed me was that your righteousness is like filthy rags. Mm, I'm mm. just a beggar trying to show another beggar where to find food. Like, I'm not mm. better than anyone. Wow. You know, so therefore, I can be okay with being in a journey myself in, mm -hmm. in, of discovery and also learning from other people who have yeah. great insights that I can learn from, right. even if we don't believe the same wow. thing. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Uh, because we have been taught so much in church, Sunday school, VPS. Bible class, to have all the answers, uh, but it sounds like you're saying that we need to sometimes uh, ask good questions as Jesus did, which is rabbinic. Uh, Jesus was a rabbi. I'm reminded of the quote uh, by Walt Whitman, be curious, not judgmental. Be curious, not judgmental. If, uh, we, we need more curious Christians so that we can even know the landscape that we're facing in terms of being a witness for Christ. It has been such a joy to be with Rasul Berry. Rasul Berry. He's a bad man. He's a bad man. And God has used him this morning in a non traditional, just in a conversation. We have shown today, Rasul, the power of conversation to just sit down and talk with one another. Now, the next time you see Rasul, uh, he's going to be standing here preaching. Uh, don't you want to hear him preach? He was preaching a few times here this morning. And so we just thank God for this man and how God has used him. And uh, we want to be creative. Uh, it has been my great joy. His wife, Tamika, is here, uh, whom he met at uh, University of Penn. Uh, his lovely daughter, Ariana, is here. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, our children, particularly when they're adult children like Ariana, don't want to hang out with their parents. And so I want to give her, uh, commend her for hanging out with her parents. We've spent some time together. We love Ariana, we love Tamika, and we love Rasul. These many years, over two decades, that we've had a relationship with him, now he is a church planter uh, in one of the most difficult communities on planet Earth, New York City, in the intersection and in the marketplace of ideas. And he is engaging the cultural conversation. I want to remind you to give it is a app aspect of worship. Uh, we've had an online giving upgrade. The mobile giving app is no longer available. You might as well take it off of your phones. However, the new website is fully mobile responsive. So while it is not in the form of an app, the giving app, you can go right to the website uh, with your uh, smartphone. And it's very much upgraded. It is a lot clearer. And you'll find that the giving experience is much more streamlined. There are ways to give. You can give online the link and uh, click give online you can also give by the cash app pj samaj for the love offering as i don't live by salary but i live based on the generosity of god's people and cbcc resources is for all other offerings you can also give on venmo cbcc resources is the username for venmo pj point main for the love offering and then of course you can give by cash or check you can come and drop off your offering between the hours of 11 a.m and noon we shall be here uh, practicing social distancing. All of us have on masks and we're social distanced right now. The same is true uh, when you come. Uh, we'll even come to your home if need be. You just call and let us know that you want to do so. If you want to contact me, you can reach me at Rev Paul J. James at careview.online. Rev Paul J. James at careview.online. Remember the two J's in the middle. Or you can call me at 610 259 CARE. 610 259 2273. Send your prayer request to Deacon Alice. Her email is alinew2 at yahoo.com. alinew2 at yahoo.com. We want to pray for you in our push-up groups and in 
and a part wherever we are. We want to pray. If you need a membership, uh, you uh, are welcome to join Careview Community Church. You can do so online, uh, careviewcommunitychurch.org slash join. And you want to park yourself here during this kind of pandemic time, we'll give you watch care. If you interact with us through the live stream, we're happy to have you to be a part of our family. We'll do a new orientation in the fall. Follow us on social media at Careview Church, on Instagram, at Careview Community, on Facebook, and of course, Careview Media on YouTube as we have our own channel. Like, comment, share, and subscribe to Careview in social media. And so it has been a great joy to be with Rasul Berry. I just feel there's a singing spirit right now. There's a closing worship spirit. Are you with me? Can you sing it's all? It's all because of you. Oh Lord, it's all because of you. Any good that I've done, y'all stand, y'all stand. And all that I do, oh, it's all because of you. One more time, sing it's all, yes it's all. so thankful this morning that we have had a chance to talk with Rasul. I could have talked all day, but we got to get him on a train to go back as he has a worship service to be a part of in Brooklyn, New York. And I'm going to take him to the train station right now. I'm going to give a benediction, a good saying over you who are gathered, over you who are in live stream. I love you so much and I miss you in live stream. I miss y'all. I'm going to ask that as I give the benediction, just go right out. Uh, you can give in the lobby if you'd like to uh, on your way out, and uh, we will fellowship outdoors. Uh, but may God bless you and heaven smile upon you. Father God, we thank you so much for the word of God. We thank you that it has been laced into the conversation. Oh, the joys, oh, the wonder, oh, the glory of God that can be seen when two brothers come together in unity. It is right there that you can measure blessing. Thank you that we have all been in this discussion with Russell Berry. Would you bless him with daily bread? Bless him as he becomes a meaning maker and as he is a kingdom man uh, who is breaking down barriers and who is uh, sharing Jesus with people in all walks of life through digital media, through documentary, and through all kinds of creative means. May your anointing rest on the man of God. As he advances the gospel. And Lord, may we today have a fresh filling of your spirit that allows us to participate in the cultural conversation in a manner that makes Jesus real to people who don't know you. And Lord, bless these your people that the love of God, that the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit would rest and rule and abide upon your people. And that your grace would be evident in every day of our lives. In Jesus' name, let all God's people say, Amen. God bless you, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>